the gig. So. <laughs> Volume is back now. Um, good. Uh, so, Vice might have missed my intro. We are talking about exit strategies. Our guest today is Mr. John Rowland. Um, he is joining me from the East Coast, and we'll get you some updates on some of the things he's doing. He always does some webinars for barcharts.com, etc. So, let's talk about exit strategies. You have been around the world with regards to seeing what yourself does on the floor of the exchanges, as well as screen-based trading and students you've taught. So. Walk me through this this process of exit strategies and what you see the, the strengths and weaknesses that people are falling into. Well, I think the common mistake a lot of traders do is they do a really good job on finding entries or planning out a trade, and then they do a horrible job on an, uh, an exit. Now, like you said before, is that most of our your viewers and the, the students that I have taught before you know you're taught that basic stop to target entry process right where you you know you define your trade by your stop that's an exit so what we what we call a pre entry exit so we have a pre entry exit of a stop loss and we have a pre entry exit of a, a a target but you know you get always heard that expression you know let your uh, profits run cut your losses and so i have rules of risk that are based on um, three elements, and the three elements will be that I want to learn, I want to eliminate risk, I want to manage risk, and I want to profit from risk. And so eliminate risk, you know, we can't eliminate all risk, but setting stops is one way of eliminating risk. Uh, manage risk, how do I get my stop to break even? And then how do I profit, right? And And the theory here is that, yeah, there are going to be moments in time as I move my stop from stop loss to break even to profit whatever rules that I'm going to employ employ one of the typical ones is the, you know a trailing stop or a technical trailing mm -hmm. stop but where I get to a target and that will give me more permission to move my stop into a profitable position but there are going to be moments in time where the market is going to give you a really good profit and that profit could be a based on a target or it just could be just price goes super super high now think about price we know what price is price is just a record of emotion right I mean think about it it's an emotion between buyers and sellers L let me put it this way and this is kind of where my brain is at on this let's say you are a purveyor of goods some kind of high-end good let's say a jewelry watches cars wine whatever and somebody walks into your store and has a fistful of hundred dollar bills and they are juiced up to buy something. Matter of fact, they're going to, they go right in front of the store and they want to buy the most expensive thing that's in your store. What are you going to say to them? No, I don't want to sell it to you right now. Matter of fact, why don't you go home, leave my store right now. And matter of fact, the next time you come to the store, I'm probably going to sell this whatever you wanted to buy, but I'm going to sell it to you for cheaper mm -hmm. because price has what? The emotion that is gone, right? So I really believe that there, you have to have a set of rules in place that gives you permission to exit a trade when the market is gone exuberant or parabolic or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. And um, that is one thing that I think a lot of traders miss out on because what happens is that by the time the market goes parabolic and they make the adjustment and then the market falls back, you know, they've given away a lot of potential profits. You know, when we look at things, uh, especially right now, we're seeing so many parabolic moves. And, and normally we would reserve parabolic move discussion for something like cryptocurrency, which certainly does have plenty of them. But and we were seeing them in some of the commodity spaces as well. We'll look at that in a little bit. Corn and, and wheat, lumber especially. I mean, these things are just, you've got to be scratching your head at Janet Yellen going, what are you smoking to think that there's no inflation out there when I'm looking at these things jump 100% in six months? Um, in a situation like that, uh, there there is a... A psychological I don't know trait or downfall that happens where I'm in something that's on a big run it's moving great and I go man hit my target I jump ship and I get out and I make whatever so let's say 20% profit awesome and you're patting yourself on the back like hell yeah man nailed that one and then you look at it 
a week later, a month later, and it, you know it's up triple from where you got out. Right. How do you deal with that? Are there special things that because I I have ways that I approach it. I'm curious how you tackle that to well, to accommodate for that either the damage of the psychology that you got out or do you get enti out entirely? Well, there's two points that you could do. First is that when you get one of those parabolic moves and you get to one of your higher t high time frame targets, yeah, you don't have to get out of the whole position. Maybe you can get out a, a, a percentage of a position, something called scaling out, that would be. But, you know, the other thing is I would rather sell at a profit, a very extreme profit, and then put that money in the bank Right? I'm not going to keep that profit all at risk, put that money in the bank, and then re-enter the mar market at a much smaller risk. In other words, I'll look for another entry. I won't, you know, who says you can't go back to the well multiple times? So I might look for another entry to get back in the trade, especially if the price goes up. I would rather sell out, lock in profit, put money in the bank, and then p buy at an even higher price. That, to me, that's a good sign that that, that trend is going to go mm -hmm. um go higher. So there's two things that we could do there. The other thing that you kind of pointed out is about this emotional aspect, right? And if price goes to one of your big targets and you make 20% or 30% or whatever you want and you ring the register and you walk walk away from that trade and that trade ends up going another, you know, three times farther, you can't look at it as a missed opportunity. You have to be very happy with the rules that you placed, right? Non emotional, rule set, rule based, boom, I got the trade, I'm happy, move on, let's find another trade. Now, be it could be the same market, yeah, for sure. But you can't have that FOMO, right? Mm -hmm. You can't have that, um, that regret that, oh, I got out and the price went much higher. So I think it's a combination of both, is stick to your rule base, don't let emotion get involved, and there are other opportunities, either scale out or look to put money in the bank, right? Bird in hand is worth more than two in the bush, and then look for an opportunity to go back into that market, but not risk that big profit that you have already captured. You know, I think this is a challenge that a lot of people face. It's a comment, uh, Tom Lopez posted this one in chat. He says, I either get out too early or even worse, I'm too late working on this. And and I like that you said, at least you're working on it, right? It's about figuring out kind of how to set up those rules and strategy for yourself. I'll give you guys a, a first-hand example. I, uh, let me see if I can go and show you this one over here. I was trading, I know, I hate to say it, I was trading Dogecoin. And I'm not. I don't like Dogecoin. I think it's absolute crap. I think it's a joke. I think it's a. It's pretty much a scam. But um, I ended up buying Dogecoin. I'm trying to figure out where exactly it was. It won't tell you the, the price that I bought it at, unfortunately. Um, so we'll go to the price chart here. I bought it at 33 cents, and I just bought you know, about eight grand worth just for fun because I knew Elon Musk was coming on the program on Saturday Night Live this weekend, and we'll probably get that push towards a dollar. Now to John's t conversation talk track. I put in, a, as soon as I bought it, I put in a target at 66 cents. Basically saying, 100%, I am more than happy with 100% Thank you very rate. much. Thank you very much. However, this is one of those cryptocurrencies that anything can happen. As much as this thing is a steaming pile of gar useless garbage, it could still go to a buck or, or possibly even higher. So I, I just want to show you here that I did this and I have an order. I was sitting there at 66 cents. It filled me, what, was yesterday or day before yesterday? yesterday geez uh, time flies and you're having fun and that took out half now I could have sold all of it I could have sold it 100% but I, I I wanted to let that second half run so the, the beauty of what I did here and this is kind of one of my tactics and strategies with regards to exits is if it reaches my target I'm taking off half no matter what I'll take off half I can reevaluate and potentially let that second half run in this case, I'm letting the second half run. I have a stop loss in place at 49 cents right now on this one. So no matter what, I'll take a profit on the second half as well. Just maybe not as much as the 66 cents per coin. So for me, this is a result of what happened in the past where I would buy something. It would do what I thought, hit my target, and then I'd close it out and be very happy with my rate of return. And two days later, it would double in price. You know, you gotta be kidding me. So I, I, I've i tailored it and now I'll do, let the second half run, and maybe at a certain point I'll scale out of the second half. But as uh, Big Eb says here, leg out I think is a very critical part of the exit strategy process. 
Yeah, I would totally agree with you. I think that that scaling out process is key to really trying to increase your profits exponentially, which leads back to the beginning of the entry is that for a lot of folks who trade on a small amount of accounts or a limited amount of contracts, then the importance of learning how to leverage or be in as many contracts as you can possibly get in the realm of the risk that you can afford because... You know, for instance, like in futures trading, if you're only trading one contract, how do you scale out of one contract? Right, you really right. can't, right? Now, I mean, if you were trading in a one S&P contract, you could probably, you know, scale out, do some kind of funky micro versus mini micro combination. But, you know, then you're talking about more margin and all that kind of stuff. But um, the point being is that, you know, you can't have a one lot contract or, you know, if you're trading 100 shares or 10 shares or whatever like that. You know, if you take off one share or ten shares, you know, yeah, you're locking in profit, but you know, how much do you have left, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's more important too. Uh, the beauty of it. Um, is there a? I just I, I must. I love stories. Is there is there one, a trade from your past that you can remember? Because they sting with me like like a tattoo, where you got out of something and you just realize that. You know, a week later, like, why did I get out of this thing? Is there one that just really strikes you? I know right now you're, you're in, you just got out of corn, right? Yeah, well, um, I mean, I, I, I can think of a couple trades way in the past, but I'd rather just talk about two recent trades that I just did, which reflects my philosophy. First one is um, CGC, the cannabis growth. Got all, you know, back in the spring, in the yep. early spring. I don't know. Do you have that up? Yeah, I got it. So you can see that I, I can't remember exactly where I got. Yeah, I think it was around, I think you can see there's a gap out where it just kind of broke out and then it retraced around $16 or something. I'd have to look at my, my chart. There's um, a lot of gaps on this bad boy. <laughs> no, but it was a big gap up and then you had a, a re retracement correction, I, you know, where came back and filled the gap. I think yeah. it was around $16. Anyhow, it was whatever. That's where I got in. And... Right, and then like what in two weeks' time it was parabolic, right? Yeah. It was poo 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 poo. So, um, you know, how far am I going to allow? Well, let me let me sh can I sh share my screen for a second? So of I course. Can... All right, cool. You share, feel free to share your screen anytime. All right, you can see my bar chart page. Uh, not yet. Okay, start sharing now. How's that? Uh, I see. I see your fans only page. What is this? Oh, I'm kidding. What? I see. Your, <laughs> I see your bar chart page. There you go. Okay. Uh, you're, you're so bad. <laughs> I'm making you blush up there, buddy. <laughs> now, listen, I don't have that one of those things. That's, okay, so uh, uh, come on, computer, wake up. My computer is on. Um, off, it's off today, right now. It doesn't want to work. <laughs> Okay, so canopy growth here. So it, it came into an area of what we would consider a demand zone or whatever, and then, right? Yep. Um, so here's where I basically got in, and there's our parabolic price movement. Now, here's my point, right? I got in around here, it's $24. That's what it was, $24.26. And it goes up to $52. That's a 100% return. In the price of an equity, well, let's be realistic. You know, you get 100% return on uh, an equity. That's a huge um, profit. So, where do I feel like this trade is successful? I mean, how can I tell this trade is successful, right? Mm -hmm. And I want to give myself permission to say, "Hey, wow, this is a great opportunity." Now, again, you know, where would I be looking for an opportunity to sell out? Well, I mean, I would be also looking at a higher time frame. And notice the red line here is right in that line where we would anticipate, you know, potential overhead supply. So that's kind of our game plan, right? But a lot of folks would say, hey, you know what? It, let's move our stop up. Let's, you know, maybe you would have had to move your stop up from way down here to maybe right there, right? And now price comes up to your target and you don't ring the register and then next thing you know, boom, you know, you just got stopped out. Well, if I was doing a technical trailing stop, I gave away $10 of profit on this one particular stock. Right. So one of the rules I like, one of the tools that I like is I like to use Bollinger Bands, and not for entries, but actually to help me find exits. And that's, and we'll change 
this color here so it's a little bit clearer for mm -hmm. you guys. You know, and I th well, just for he's drawn this out, I, I think it's interesting that you guys noticed that when that trade on canopy growth was made, this wasn't uh, that there was no supply zones above you. You know, you look off to the left there, and there were definitely you know a bunch of supply zones lined up on canopy growth that go you know back to its peak back in 2018. So there certainly was targets that he could have set up to evaluate. Okay, I can map out my trade here. So there you go. And which I did, and I was continually moving my stop. But at one point, when I got this huge price movement, this Bollinger Band piercing outside of the Bollinger Band, outside of two standard deviations, this is permission for me to say, hey, you know what? I got the guy in my store. Emotion is overtaking the market. And I want to sell him as much mer merchandise that I have in my store. I want to get the money out of his pocket and into my pocket, right? And so this is the point where I would have just I just sold out of this position and got out and I would never look back and say regret that you know I missed out if the canopy went up again now what to your point let me go to oh yeah here we go more. yeah we go grab a bowl right. of cornflakes real quick. Uh, yeah, more expensive than diamonds, I think nowadays. Let me interview Janet Yellen and be like, "Okay, just Janet, what is this? <laughs> what is this chart showing you, Janet? I, I I heard your comments yesterday, and you said inflation is not a concern. R tell me what this is showing us, Janet." <laughs> right, right. Here's corn. Right. I mean, this is not like it's like a high demand commodity. I mean, yeah, it is, but I mean, you know, it's corn. It's not like you know. It's air or water. <laughs> I mean, you know, come on. But look at it. It's, price of corn went up a dollar from this blue line represents where I got in a trade. I think it was around on April 14th or so. Yeah, right around, around in this area, somewhere in here. I think right there. And we went from five dollars and seventy-four cents to six dollars and seventy-seven cents. Again, one of the tools that I like to use is those Bollinger bands. And Again, if I put the Bollinger Bands here, again, let me change my fill. I don't know why my fill is not staying white. Better contact those developers over there, Bart. Yeah, exactly. Again, so <laughs> here, price shot out of my Bollinger Band, and this red line, right? This is a 10 year chart. Yeah, Janet Yellen, there's no inflation. None, none. And there was a gap here, right? Nice little, you know. Uh, long-term gap price came right into it and filled it now where is price now well it's above that I can't have FOMO and say hey listen I missed out on this next piece I made a plan I set about my plan Mar the market was emotional I took advantage of that emotion and look the price did come back and if I had a, a technical trailing stop I probably would have been probably stopped, stopped out yep. probably right around there right <clears throat> And I think that that's one of the big challenges. You know, you keep that keep that slide up. <clears throat> that's one of the challenges. Uh, you know, one of the things that's it's interesting about the show is seeing how different people calculate stops or measure stops. And for everybody out there, a real simple one is what a lot of traders will do is they'll if they're moving their stop up from the initial stop to maybe now locking in some profit. You know, the the common practice is to put it below the low of the previous day. In a situation like this one on corn. You know, you did really well using that strategy. I mean, it just kept on going, and then all of a sudden, on that second one to the right there, you know, it dripped down. Would have taken it would have taken me out on that strategy. Um, you know, because you went up past six, you went up to like six eighty, and then all of a sudden down to six thirty eight. Um, you know, that's a pretty significant drop. Probably would have taken me out, and you can't feel bad about leaving that other money on the table. Um, if you had multiple contracts, maybe you peel off a couple and let the second half go, but. You know, there's all kinds of way we can calculate, um, not calculate, but use these resources to keep us in trades. All right, so let's talk about this now. Right here's now I've gone down to a monthly chart, which is now a, a 60 minute chart instead of a daily chart. And there's that Bollinger Band piercing that gave me permission to ring the register and walk away, right? Where price, like in that red candle, which you saw, in the, this was that price action that would have definitely stopped us out. I mean, that price action, you would agree, was even on this time frame, would have stopped you out. But here I'm saying, okay, I, I like this trend. This trend is a still strong trend. I still believe in the story. Well, what am I going to do? Well, here's my trade. Now, let me get rid of Bollinger Band so this is a little bit clearer. 
I got back in this trade, and this is a classic. This is a classic entry that I know that you teach, right? Here's a gap breakout that broke above a mm -hmm. previous high, where price came back and did what? Retest. Close the gap and, re and retest the breakout. So I'm back in corn again. Thank you very much. <laughs> so what did I miss out? Yeah. Well, in this trade, it happened to work out because it's right th they're right there. But all I missed out was maybe this little bit of profit where I got out here and now I'm getting back in here, right? Now, a lot of times you do maybe maybe miss out maybe like a bigger piece here, but that's okay. I don't care about that. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at a non-emotional rule-based system that allows me to get into trades to maximize my profit. And when the market gives me an emotional exit, I'm going to ring that register and run, and I don't care what happens afterwards. I'm still going to go back to my rules and not worry about what happens into the future. Speaking of rules, out on your Bollinger Bands again, I'd like to get your take on this one because I think everyone utilizes these indicators slightly differently, and I know we have some people in the crowd that are uh, that do like Bollinger Bands. So in that up move that we were looking at earlier, you had a pretty nice, strong up move, and you pointed out one candle you said specifically, I think it was a uh, different time, I think we had it on the daily. Uh, you want the daily? Sure. There you go. And and you point out that red candle there that broke through and, and just really accelerated, but it came back down, and you said it was outside the upper Bollinger Bands. How do you discern between, you know, you look at the four candles before that one, they were all outside the upper Bollinger Band as well in a close. And you know, the textbooks, I got I have stacks of useless technical analysis textbooks over here that all tell you that, you know, if it's it should not be outside that upper Bollinger Band. But that doesn't mean you should be going short. How do you do you, are those false signals for you, or what is it about Bollinger Band that that you find very useful? So I do use them for entries, but I really kind of use them in this case to help me find better exits. And I think the key for all Bollinger Band traders is there is a cycle of Bollinger Bands where you go from a cycle of um, uh, congestion or coiling as they look here. And so this would not be a exit for me because the band's width is really narrow. When the bandwidth gets wide, right, that's when you can start giving yourself that permission of looking for potential exits. Now, normally what happens is actually a Bollinger Bands, when they start to, you know, you have a coiling and it starts to break out like this, this is a, this is kind of giving you permission that, yeah, now we're going to stretch the bands. Now price volatility is coming back into this market, and I'm going to ride that wave until it reverses. Now, the key for me is when you have the whole candle settle outside uh -huh. uh, the Bollinger Band. That is usually a signal that something is up, either that it's about to break out or that um, about to reverse. You know, you've you've gone you've gone too far too fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Do you ever? And, so and this is and this is a, a tweak on this, but you know, we Bollinger Bands is obviously two standard deviations, and it's wrapped around the twenty period moving average. Do you ever? Tweak that because I knew a guy he used to do, he used to change his Bollinger Bands to go three standard deviations, which is supposed to get what, like 99% of all the data in, in it? Yeah, yeah. Um, I do sometimes do tweak it a little bit, but um, like you said, if you go from like two standard deviations, which is like 95%, to three different, you know, the what you pick up in that extra price movement for that very small piece of um, percentile. Right. You know, it's, is, I, I don't is know it worth it's it? that it's that is if it's that worth it. But I do know that the, I know a fellow who does a Bollinger Band um, piercing where he'll use two percent, the two standard deviation as the indicator that now I'm going to do something, and then he uses a two point two or a two point one, and then if price gets above that, then he'll let it run. But if price deviates back from 2.2 back into 2.0 mm -hmm. that that re mean reversion right that how Bollinger Bands are designed um, that would be his signal to exit that trade so it's a combination of kind of like a Bollinger Band confirmation does that make sense yeah 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 um, it, it does but look at this <laughs> trade here this is on the daily run while you're talking but I'll give them look at the 60 minute it was the same Bollinger Band Pearson at the same time, or excuse me, was it over here? Yeah, over here. So even it, it it's the same point. It, it happened in multiple time frames. That was what was really the key for me. 
I'm actually, uh, I'm, I'm trying, I was trying to do some fancy video editing over here and it's just not working. <laughs> I wanted to put your, now oh, there you go, I, it, it, it just worked, I just finally figured it out and that's what I was trying to do, I was trying to put your, your picture over the, over the chart, never mind, well now I just, I'll have to just go back, the be beauty of trying to do stuff live on the air, man. <laughs> uh, cool, but, um, yeah. so for exit strategies, I, I think, you know, we talk so much about journaling, we talk so much about a trading plan. Uh, no matter what position you guys are in, there's three variables that always have to be in there. Number one is your entry, stop loss, your price targets. Without question, that way you remove that emotional euphoria that happens. I know, Brendan's gonna go, I don't use stop losses or price target. It's okay, you don't have to. I'm just saying it's gonna be one of the keys to longevity because if you, ha if you are long on anything, corn, soybeans, S&P, NASDAQ, Bitcoin, Dogecoin, doesn't matter, and that thing rips against you so extremely, and your margin at all, your your profits are gone. And just like Dogecoin, or like, what's a good one today? Brandon likes to give me a hard time about EOS because I, I like EOS. Uh, it was up 50% by the way today. It could easily drop 50% tomorrow. And there's a reason you wanna have stop losses in place for these things because obviously it's gonna protect you from major downside. But the other side is, like John says, giving yourself permission to make money on it. And a lot of people will cut their winners short uh, and let their losers run. What we're saying here is cut your losses short period no matter what, but take profit when you can on a long position by hitting your targets and then scaling out or as some call it legging out and letting that second half portion run, but you have to come up with those rules that are for you. Uh, for me, it's pretty simple. They're generally based off of supply and demand zones, so I have those set targets and then uh, let that second half or second portion run. And to me, that's been my strategy for the last 20 years. <laughs> it's a simple formula, right? Small losses, bigger winners, right? Yep. I mean, you can't make it any easier than that. <laughs> we like that a lot. Uh, John, right? yeah, you are doing, uh, you've been doing webinars a ton. I know you've always got something going on. Uh, and you mentioned uh, to me earlier that you got a, uh, some sessions coming up. What's your upcoming schedule look like with regards to uh, webinars or teaching? Uh, well, uh, next week we're doing uh, a webinar on unusual options volume, one of our pages on our website that uh, helps you find large amounts of volume in options at, uh, based on previous open interests. And what you can do with that is that usually there's one of three scenarios that's probably happening. One is that it could be an unusual options activity that isn't a pre-event like earnings where folks are kind of jumping in or insider trading or whatever you want to call it. Right. Uh, the other would be when large institutions are doing the business of money management, you know, hedging. You know, a lot of times folks will say, oh, somebody's buying all these puts, right? Well, that means the market's going down. No, you have to look at it in the big picture and they'll say that a stock is going up, 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 up. Well, somebody might be buying puts as insurance, right? In other words, they don't want to put a giant 10 million share stop with their broker in the market because the market's going to pick that off. What they'll do is they'll buy options to protect themselves. In other words, that's how they manage the risk. But looking at different option scenarios that could be employed based on is it uh, exuberance, you know, uh, novice type activity, is it institutional activity, or um, you know, could it be just people that are getting uh, lining up based on some kind of information that is going to come out being uh, earnings. So that's one that's coming up. Uh, I'm looking at my schedule now. So here's some of the subjects that we're going to do over the next six weeks. We're going to look at um, the dogs of the Dow. We created a portfolio in the beginning of the year. We're going to go back to that portfolio and look and see how those stocks are doing compared to the Dow and compared to the rest of the S&P. We're going to look at long straddles. Uh, we're going to talk about one of another one of our pages, which is top picks. Uh, Greeks, candlesticks, uh, technical analysis, and then uh, sometime in July, we're going to look at some new charts, the new um, candlestick charts. I don't know if you use them, the Heiken Hase's? No, Heiken Hashi, no. I don't. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I, it's one of those things that I look 
and not to dissuade anybody from learning it. It's just I'm I've become this old dog now, and it's like I know what works for me. I I like to think I'm a candle reading master at this point. Like I, I don't want to mess it up at all. But there are some great new tools. Research. I might I might check it out, but I'm afraid it's going to sway me to start using some new tool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree with you too. Like Renko's, right? I mean, they're kind of like point figure charts. I like point figure charts, mm -hmm. but. Yeah, exactly. You master something really. It's master something really good. You know, you're afraid to step outside your box, right? So I, I get it. I, you know, and that's one of the cool things about being with Bar Chart is that it's really is continue. I'm continuing growing as a trader, which is I think is important for everybody, no matter how long you've been in the market. Growing as a trader, you've even been doing this for not like growing this you're way. You're going horizontally. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Nice. Um, all right. So one other little thing here that I was looking at these charts that you had up earlier, especially with regards to like corn and and and, and uh, lumber, which has just been going crazy. You know, at what point do you, as a trader, back away from them and say, you know what, this crap's moved way too much? Like, because I, I know that there was an inclination for you to jump back into corn because it broke out, retested. Okay, fine. Um, but is there a point where you look at a commodity futures, because you've traded commodity futures for a long time, you just say, you know what, this is just probably too dangerous for me to even to mess with, or you start building short positions? Because here's here's the chart of lumber, guys. Uh, I'll bring this up. Actually, this is corn. And that's, you, it may seem crazy to you, but that is since mid-July of, um, or maybe August of 2020. It went from a low on corn of 306 to right now it's it's 719. I mean, that's well over 100%, so there's no inflation, folks, nothing to see here. And then lumber, we look at this one as well. I mean, you go back to April of last year, it was at 257, it's at 1645. I mean, this this is the like a chart of Dogecoin right now, it's crazy, and this is a physical, useful product called lumber. Uh, is there a certain point where you just walk away from this? Yeah, I definitely, you, you just have this kind of sixth sense that when volatility gets, especially in the commodities world, when the volatility gets just crazy like this, that it, it's just a, a disaster waiting to happen. And usually in um, in the old days, we used to have limits, locked limits, and that was usually a, a sign that right. something was was going to happen. Because I can tell, I used to tell a story. That you like old stories, right? Here's I love story. old Ready? stories. Yep. Okay. So. Um, I mean, I was in the in the gasoline pit at the time, and we just just for so everybody knows when he says a gasoline pit, this is on an exchange. He's not on the side of a road stuck in a gas tank or something <laughs> with a hose. <laughs> with bye, hose. Bye, <laughs> Woo All right, sorry. So uh, we traded propane in that pit at the same time. Now, I um, I had a few propane customers, but not a lot. And I didn't do a lot of propane business. So one of the things that we used to do was we used to take our orders down to the middle of the ring and there was a guy who was a propane specialist and we would give him our orders and he'd watch them for us and then when the market came, we those orders came on the market, we'd offer them to the ring or because he watched them or babysit them, we, as a gentleman's agreement, we'd give him first refusal if he wanted to take the other side of the trade. So one day um, I'm sitting there and was, nothing was going on and this guy's partner, which his his partner's nickname was the Penguin, because this guy was only about four foot two. He wore the same black suit and white shirt every day, and he looked literally like the Penguin from uh, Batman. He waddles in the ring, whispers into the guy's ear, and uh, and then waddles out. Now this guy, his nickname was the Human Planet because he was wider than he was tall, and he <laughs> jumped up. So how was it working for the HR department on the floor? Jesus, <laughs> you, this is back when you could say these things to people. Nowadays, you call someone the Penguin, and HR's in your office, and there's a, a sexual harassment lawsuit against you. I mean, come there on. Was no HR back then. <laughs> <laughs> so the Human Planet jumps up, and he made would make LeBron James jealous how high this guy jumped. And he runs around the, all around the outside of the pit, and he asks everybody if they have any propane orders. And he goes around, and he buys all the propane he can find. Now, this is back in the 80s where, you know, snail mail and telex and quotrons and all that kind of stuff. And sure enough, about 10 minutes later, a news story comes around the main propane facility out, out in Hillbilly, Oklahoma someplace. I don't know, Oklahoma someplace. <laughs> had frozen solid and no propane was getting out. Now, in the wintertime, people use propane to heat their homes, and that's obvious. But also, farmers use propane out in the Midwest in the wintertime to keep their uh, corn and 
grains dry. It's a huge demand for that. What do you think the price of oil paint did? Yeah, shot right. up. Yeah. Not only did it shoot up, but it went up, limit up. Mm -hmm. Now the next day it went up, limit up, right? And the next day it went up, limit up. It went up, limit up, three days in a row. Wow. Now, every day it opened, limit up. It didn't trade, and nothing traded, right? No contracts changed hand. All buyers, no sellers. All buyers, no sellers. If you were a seller, you could have sold at that moment at that time. And this is really what's going to nail what I'm trying to say to you guys. So I go down to this guy, and this is on Friday. I say, hey, I saw what happened. I said, you're up like you know, a quarter of a million dollars. And he had this shit-eating grin on his face, right? And I said, are you going to get out? Are you going to take profit? And he's like, no, it's locked limit up. It's going to come in higher. Well, over the weekend, the fire department figured a way to thaw it out. Water on it. They got the weather broke. The valves opened up. And what do you think the price of propane did? Yeah, it's collapsed. Limit, yeah, limit down, limit down. Went down, limit down three days in a row without one single contract trading hands. And this guy went from making two hundred fifty thousand dollars to losing two hundred fifty thousand dollars. So the moral of the story is, a trade is only worth what it is when you get out. Yeah. As Gordon Gecko so infamous, infamously said in Wall Street, greed is good. Greed is right. Greed works. In that case, greed lost him everything. Uh, not everything. Maybe maybe everything. I don't know. But um, I, I would say as a cautionary note, guys, we talk about lock limits on the markets. I just want to show you corn here because they do happen regularly. Corn has been lock limiting all the time. You see these little dash marks over here going back to the 26th of, um, of April. Lock limit up, gaps up, and you can see it lock limited up again. That's these little horizontal dash marks, and it's dangerous because, you know, John was talking about no, no sell order. So if something lock limits up, basically what the exchange has said is you cannot sell it at a price higher than this. You can sell it at something lower, but you can't sell it at a price higher than that. So you know, if you want to get out of it, you could. You just sell it at that current price. If you're a buyer of it, um, you know, the problem with lock limit ups is quite often you have nobody out there willing to sell. So if it gaps up the next day or opens up the next day, all that pent up buying pushes it right to the next lock limit. So if you're short, a lot of times people think if it's lock limit up, I'm going to go short because it can't go any higher. Yeah, right. well, but but if this if it doesn't start to drop down, you're stuck and if it gaps up again lock limit, you're screwed, man. I mean, there's nothing you can do about it. Listen, I remember a day in natural gas, you know, you have to go back to I don't know 10, 15 years when natural gas was trading above $10. I remember a day when natural gas made a three limit move in one day. In other words, it went lock limit up, lock limit down, lock limit up. Wow. Did you have to wear a neck brace after that one? That's, that's, a, that's a good day. Talk about blood in the streets. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, all right. Well, hey, man. Thank you for coming on today. I know it's been a while. I, I look forward to your webinars. I might check out these new candlestick ones. Uh, next time you come on, though, let's. I got a topic du jour which has been asked, and that would be walk me through the a day in the life of a floor trader. And I would like what you do when you come in. You know, are you are you are you all hopped up on caffeine and then jump on the floor? It'd be fun to just talk a, a typical day because this is something that is. For all intents and purposes, dead. CME announced yesterday that most, almost every one of their pits except the Euro is going to stay open. Everything else is being shut down. Guys, another year, 100% of all open outcry pits will be gone forever. So it's fun to talk about those stories. So I want to keep that for our next one. Yeah, I heard what you said. You said that that it's going to be like stories at uh, Starbucks or something. Yeah. What does that mean? Me a dinosaur now? I don't know. You're Come a dinosaur. On. You're a good looking. You're a good looking fossil. <laughs> I mean, hey, you're calling guys. You're calling guys penguin in the human planet. I'm calling you the fossil. <laughs> you gonna roll me out like on a cart, you know, like uh, on uh, once a year, you know, like veterans of yep. foreign uh, foreign trading wars at, or something. At the, at the baseball games, I'll call them out, guys. In, in section 13B, seat seven, John Rowan, <laughs> former NYMEX floor trader. <laughs> Everyone gives you a round of applause. <laughs> yeah, I tell you what, you think it was, you know, I know you, 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 in your mind, you're thinking it was just glory days, but uh, I, know. I mean, yeah, it was, but you know, it, there was a lot of days where you go to work and nothing would happen, and you'd yeah. sit around and. But those were the days usually we get in mischief and do stupid things like call people penguins and human planets and. <laughs> 
I think I told you a story about the guy who had we made run around the exchange in his in a speedo because he lost a bet, right? I think I told you. Yes, you, that you one. told us that one. <laughs> so it's a good one. Those are the stupid days. That's what it's. Uh, I don't call them stupid, but that's just called the, they call those the heydays. The heydays. The heydays, exactly. All right, John. Well, hey, thank you so much. I appreciate you coming on, and, uh, and hopefully, I'll get a chance to join one of your webinars here in Bartchart.com sometime soon. Oh, thanks, Marlon, for having me. Come and check me out at Bar Chart, and uh, I want to wish everybody the good of all trading. Thank you. Take care, bud. All right, guys. John Rowland giving us a little bit of insights into uh, exit strategies. You know, it's interesting. We look at just different people and their different approaches to how they place stops and targets in particular. That to John was more important than actually doing the stop topic because everyone understands your exit should be your stop loss, but you know, setting your profit targets, scaling out, legging out, I mean, that's critical in my mind in keeping you in a trade, keeping you in a running trade, because we all want to grab onto one of those runners and just let it go and go and go. So anyway, John Rowland, give us some insights. And next time, we'll just talk about stories from the floor. It's always so much fun to talk about them. Um, in the years I've been spending with John Rowland and a lot of the Chicago floor trader guys, God, those stories are just absolutely fantastic. Love it. Okay. Let me uh, go into one economic calendar piece for tomorrow. Uh, we had Square report earnings. I actually sold some. I sold one put today just for fun on Square, uh, a 200 strike, and I was really surprised that Square they blew out earnings, but didn't have the greatest result out there. Uh, we'll see how that goes, but it was basically collecting for um, how many days? What, what's the date today? For 11, 11 day or sorry, um, I think it's the tw May 21st. It ended up being about a one and a half percent rate of, or sorry, 1.8 percent rate of return. So we'll take it, see how it goes. Um, all right, here's your economic announcements for tomorrow. Today, actually, the, some of the numbers that were interesting was the UK, they had their rate announcement and it was really a flat day. Normally on a rate announcement type of day, there's a lot of volatility. Here's what you have cooking for tomorrow. You notice near the middle to the bottom, we have the important US stuff, which is the unemployment rate, non-farm employment change, average hourly earnings, and then you have member Barkin speaking of the FOMC. You also have consumer credit, but I'm not too concerned about consumer credit. It's not, not that big of a deal. Uh, on the top of the page, you see Italian retail sales and construction PMI coming out for the UK. Um, a, and other than that, oh yeah, how can I forget my neighbor to the north? We got two Canadians here. We got Patrick and Brendan dueling it out in the north. They're coming out with some announcement tomorrow. That's gonna be 5.30 in the morning. That's Canadian unemployment rate, as well as their employment change. Okay, now let's see. Uh, tomorrow's show is going to be a little bit different. Normally I'll be boozing it up on a Friday. I'm kidding. I'll probably still have a cocktail for Friday's show. But uh, a friend of mine, Trey Lazera, is going to be joining us. Trey is the owner of a futures trading company called TP or Trade Pro Futures. Um, I thought it'd be interesting to talk about some of the margin issues because you guys may know if you're a futures trader, it is so vast across the board with regards to margins and margin fees. I mean, if you go to TradeStation, you pay one price. You go to Interactive Brokers, you go to pay another. You go to Trade Pro Futures, you pay another. Um, and, and one of the reasons I love Trey's company is his futures margins are some of the lowest out there. So we'll talk a little bit about margins tomorrow, maybe what you need to consider. But I want you guys to bring some questions to the table as well because you know, Trey runs a futures trading company. I'm sure you have some uh, questions about it and software, maybe uh, little nuances that you might want to get answered. So if you have questions on anything to do with the futures markets, uh, opening accounts, uh, software platforms and things like that, email me at tradermerlin at gmail.com. The sooner you get them ready, the sooner I can maybe forward those over. Remember, most people aren't as good as answering questions live. Sometimes people like to think about a question and build an answer for you. So the sooner I get questions in, the better it's going to be. All right, that's going to do it for me. I know I was supposed to do an hour show because I had the beginning all cut off. Sorry about that. I muted my mic because my dog was barking like crazy yesterday as I was doing some recording. So I, I muted it and, well, there you go. I forgot to unmute it. But we got it unmuted now. Again, for those that are new, I know we have a lot of newbies here who are joining us. If you are new, hit that subscribe button. If you like today's show, do me a favor, click on your like button, little thumbs up one there. It always helps me out. That will do it for me, everybody. Hope you enjoyed the show with John Rowland. Again, he is of barchart.com. You can check him out. He's got all kinds of webinars going on over at Barchart on a regular basis. You can see right here, there's one. I don't think this is John's particularly. This is a trader's look at unusual options volume. Is there one for next Wednesday? But John mentioned he's also doing one on the dogs of the Dow. He's talking about uh, the Greeks, candles, and a variety of other topics, which you can find at their website. So anyway, I thought you'd enjoy that. Cool. That's going to do it for me, everybody. Hope you have a fantastic day out there. I will see you all tomorrow with a nice, cold, frosty beverage. May the forces be with you. I'll see you tomorrow. Take care.